Hello and welcome to this week's episode of What Your GP Doesn't Tell You with me, Liz Tucker. I hope my show will be of interest to both doctors and patients, because of course doctors are patients themselves too. Today I'm talking to neurosurgeon Mr Henry Marsh, a pioneer of the awake craniotomy, a surgical operation performed while a patient is still awake. Henry is also an author and public speaker and has written, I think, some of the most compelling books about both being a surgeon and the many ethical and practical challenges the role throws up. But after a lifetime of treating patients, frequently for dangerous and life-threatening conditions, it was a huge shock, as Henry describes in his latest book, and finally, which has just been published, when he found himself diagnosed with prostate cancer, which was treatable, although not curable. So just how does a doctor cope? when he becomes the patient. But before we get to Henry's interview, a brief request from me. If you enjoy this podcast, it would be a huge help if you could leave a review on Apple or Spotify. It really helps the visibility of the pod, and so it makes it a lot easier for others to find. And if you could share and recommend the pod to friends and family, that would also be much appreciated. And now back to the interview with Henry. We started the interview discussing just how open doctors can be with their patients. And Henry explained why he thinks doctors need a certain level of self-deception and exaggerated self-belief. Then in the second half of the interview, Henry reveals how his perspective changed when the tables were turned and he became the one who was ill. So Henry, thank you very much indeed for joining me today. Pleasure. One of the quotes that appears at the front of your second book is from the doctor, Sir William Osler, who says that medicine is a science of uncertainty and an art of probability. Do you think today it's too easy to forget this? And both patients and perhaps doctors too have unrealistic expectations for what medicine can do. There's been a sort of broad cultural change. Patients are less deferential. Doctors are more honest. You can't fob patients off with tonics. Of course, there's also a great paradox, because in my books, I've been very honest about my failings, my mistakes. In my new book, I even tell the story of when I operated on the wrong side. But of course, on the other hand, as a patient, it's intolerable to feel your doctor doesn't know what he's doing. So most of us as patients have to have this irrational faith in our doctor's You talk about, as a surgeon, having to build up a level of self-deception and exaggerated self-belief. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's very important at the beginning of your career. I mean, when you're a junior doctor, at least in theory, that is constrained by the fact there's somebody further up the hierarchy who is supervising what you do. When you become a consultant, you are, in theory, suddenly on your own. It's changing. I'm happy to see that there is more mentoring and discussion and supervision of young consultants, perhaps, than there was in the past. But you face this enormous moral problem if you do dangerous surgery, as I did. If you don't take on the difficult cases, how do you ever get any better? And yet you may actually have colleagues elsewhere who are more experienced than you are. So the problem, of course, is you have a duty to the patient in front of you, but you also have a duty to your future patients to get better. As as a trainer, which is such an important part of being a senior doctor, you have a duty to the patient in front of you, but also to your trainees' future patients. And of course, these are not morally compatible. And deep down, we all know we're not entirely honest. You know, GMC says, always put the patient first. But actually, it should really say, always put patients first. And yet there is this asymmetry, this discrepancy, this dishonesty. It gets easier when you become a more senior doctor. And I knew my limitations, and I I could afford to tell some patients, look, I think you ought to go and see somebody else. But when you first face a complex operation that you haven't done before, I suppose one hopes as a patient that will be done under supervision so that the patient is at less risk? Well, I mean, I can't speak for other branches of surgery, but, you know, all every, every operation for the same pathology is a bit different, and some are going to be more dangerous and difficult than others. And the solution to this problem is, is teamwork. 
team working in the sense of senior doctors working together. And that is that is happening a bit more now. And the generation who trained me were so sort of lonely gods who did everything, could do everything, but really never, never discussed their cases. And were fairly unquestioned them. too. Sorry? And were fairly unquestioned. And too. were unquestioned. And you got away with it. Now nowadays it's more difficult to get away with. But there are all these sort of moral ambiguities. And the truth is, you don't want to be the first patient of a surgeon doing a complex procedure that they haven't done before. No, of course not. But I mean, surgeons aren't going to tell you that, are they? And patients never dare to ask, or scarcely ever dare to ask, how many of these operations have you done before? Because that means I don't entirely trust you. And trust is a two-way thing. It's very difficult to treat patients who don't trust you. It's interesting, actually, because I asked that question on behalf of a family member of actually a surgeon who had a really good record, but I just was yeah. interested to know his number, and he was very reluctant to tell me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It is very difficult. It means I don't trust you. I mean, it is the only rational question a patient should ask a surgeon, but the doctor-patient relationship is not a rational relationship. And I suppose it's recognising the difference between being an informed patient and a patient that doesn't trust you, and those yeah. things are different. It's, it's very difficult. Because sir, I can't speak for other branches of medicine, but surgery ultimately is all about decision making. The technical side, the operating, sounds a strange thing to say, it is actually quite easy once you've learnt it. The problems arise with decision making, and then the the personality and psychology of the surgeon, the culture in which they work, all become very important. And I was interested that you say that the difficult and the dangerous operations are actually the most attractive and exciting, but presumably oh, yes. also the ones yeah. most likely to go wrong. Yes. But, I mean, that's what drew me into neurosurgery. It was the, the, the risk, the, the excitement, the, the power and everything else, as well as which a deep and passionate wish to treat patients. I mean, the fact one finds operating exciting is because you're so anxious the patient should do well. So there's no contradiction between going into surgery because it's so exciting and caring for your patients. The problem is to get the balance right in terms of knowing when to operate and when not to operate. Do you think in the UK we're less likely to overoperate than in the States? Oh, yeah, yeah. In the States, is a. have just been reading Haslam's book. Right? I know most of it already, but he just goes over quite well. The Haslam, who, who was chairman of NICE and all sorts of things, and, and a good egg. Uh, I mean, the American health, which I know I've trained a lot of Americans. I've been, I've been, I've been in many, many American hospitals. And it's, it's a disaster. Yeah, sure, if you're wealthy, you'll get the best healthcare system, the best healthcare possible. But I mean, it's madly extravagant. It's completely crazy. But there's a risk if you're wealthy, you, you will be overtreated. Oh, yes, very much so. And that's, that's the problem with the American system. But that's, it's it's complicated, as of all these things. It's partly the doctors, it's partly the hospitals. So much of the system there is driven for profit. But it's also American optimism, which as a weary, fatalistic Brit, I always like when I go to America. So I thought, yes, we can, as opposed to the world, I don't think so. I'm not sure. But it, it's the downside, the flip side to American optimism. So you've talked only about the need for informed consent, but sometimes the things that perhaps a patient doesn't want to know. One of the comments you made was that you've never spelt out that in some operations you had to remove part of the brain. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How do you balance those two things? Well, you have to spend a long time looking at the patient, talking a bit, listening to them, trying to work out. And you have to take a slightly paternalistic decision, what I think or hope they need and want to hear. But ideally, when you're having very difficult conversations about difficult things, it really ought to be more than one conversation. You know, I learned fairly on operating on children with brain tumours, which where I had a sort of advantage because my baby son had had a brain tumour. Um, you know, you really have to come back again. You have to have a series of conversations to try to work out um, what to say. It's an art. And one, as I'm always saying in my lectures, you know, one of the great problems about communication in medicine is you never get any feedback. 
you know, patients, patients and their families don't tell you afterwards whether you did well or not. I think you said that only one patient had ever criticised your face, how you'd communicated with her. Yeah, only once I can remember to my face criticising me for having told her too bluntly that she had breast cancer. So how do doctors learn this art of talking to patients? <laughs> I don't know is the answer. Medical students now are taught a certain amount about communication. And the young doctors I know say they, they found it helpful. But you're still kind of wallowing in the dark in terms of how you come across. And occasionally, because I now have a sort of public profile with my writing, I occasionally hear or read things that I patients say I said. I say, I, 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 I don't really say that. And then, of course, you know memory is deceptive, both the patient's memory and my own. One's very influenced by your senior by your senior doctors and by the culture of the department you work in. All doctors have this struggle to find a balance between being kind and being detached. I and mean, you you can get too involved. You, know, you have to be detached, but you mustn't lose kindness and compassion in the process. But again, the problem is a lot of the most intense conversations are in private. You know, I now regret that when I did outpatients, I'd never have anybody else in the room with me because I wanted it to be a totally private, intimate conversation. In retrospect, this was a mistake because it meant my trainees rarely saw me talking to patients on their own. You also say that patients are incredibly suggestible and that it's really important to think about every word you say. Yeah, it's so easy to drop some casual remark um, which the patient then picks up on. And we all know patients as a patient. We only hear part of what we're told. One of the things you'd always advised your own patients was not to have their brain scans unless they had a yes. problem. Yes. So why then did you choose to take part in a study of brain scans in healthy people and completely ignore your own advice? Uh, self-deception, willful, wishful thinking um, is what ultimately is the theme of my new book. It's all about self-deception. My self-deception over my brain scan, the fact that I denied my prostate symptoms for ages and ages. Um, and then ultimately, it's really about the way there's this huge collective denial about climate change. So the book ends with a discussion of my mother, who grew up in Nazi Germany, um, and then escaped. She wasn't Jewish. And about my granddaughters. And this human capacity of us is our inbuilt optimism but you know we, we're going to be okay so this self-deception involved thinking that your brain miraculously would not be showing signs of ages yes. yeah yeah because one does see a few people in 70s or 80s with brains that aren't very atrophic but it wasn't so much the atrophy of my brain as all the white matter damage there were lots of them were high, high signal lesions in the white matter which we don't really know what they signify they they signify increased risk of stroke which horrifies me, doesn't necessarily, doesn't seem to correlate to dementia. I wonder, but it's not, one could ever find out, when I was operating, my blood pressure must have been extremely high at times. And I just wonder, my blood pressure now with five milligrams of a calcium blocker a day is, is quite normal. Um, but I wonder whether all that stress could somehow damage my brain a bit. I mean, having said that, I don't feel I have a damaged brain other than being a bit slower, um, you know, not being able to do mental arithmetic very quickly. I can still write and talk and everything else. So it's part of this thought process that doctors learn so much about diseases that they have to assume that patients are the ones that become ill. Exactly. It. It's, it's the us and them. It's the us and them thing, which you learn as soon as you become a doctor, as soon as you start sticking needles into patients and doing nasty things to them. Your relationship is no longer a simple philanthropic one. Patients become objects of anxiety and sometimes anger and resentment, and it all gets much more difficult. Also, as a medical student, I, I think I did, I'm not, I've yet to meet many doctors who said they didn't go through this. You start learning all about these horrible diseases, which start in very humdrum ways, and then you get convinced you've got it yourself. I, I thought I had acute leukemia for three days. Um, because a bit of blood in my toothbrush. And then you learn, no, you know, disease happens to patients, not to me. And you become sort of one of the elect. And there's such strong pressure, particularly in hospital medicine, 
the patients of its of underclass, um, like prisoners in the prison, and we rule over them. And I can't stress this enough. At the same time, if you're too nice to patients, you know, you, you're going to find it very difficult. If, if every time you worry about every scan result, which you can't get back to the patient immediately, you can't do it, you know. And yet I know the agony of waiting for scan results because I knew it from my son's brain tumour. And I tried to get results back to my patients as quickly as possible for follow-up scans. And as the NHS got more and more bureaucratic, it got more and more difficult. In fact, it ended up almost impossible. Uh, That was terribly upsetting. This sort of self-deception that doctors have, they yeah. go through a period of hypochondria yes. and then they have to convince themselves they're never going to be ill. Yes, that's right. Is that part of what led you, despite having fairly classic symptoms of prostate cancer, to take yeah. so long? Yes, I think so. And you actually say in the book that doctors with cancer often present with advanced disease. It is said. It is, it is, is there any evidence for that, any research? I know, it's any anecdotal stories. But I certainly saw a few patients, to medical doctors, who had very advanced brain secondaries and things like that. Commonly said, but I don't think anybody's done much research into it. On the flip side, are there any benefits as a doctor when you become the patient? One of the few benefits of being a patient and a doctor is you you ask your colleagues, whom should I go and see? So you're a truly informed consumer. And the interesting thing about that, my impression is on the whole, I, like most doctors, when we're ill, we want to see somebody who's sensible. You know, we're not so concerned about brilliant this or brilliant that. We want to see somebody who's reliable and sensible. And of course, the doctor is patient. I don't have total confidence in the doctors looking after me because I know they're human. Because I know I was human when I was a doctor. Now, that having been said, I'm perfectly happy with the treatment uh, I'm receiving at the moment. You clearly thought a huge amount about how to communicate with patients. So were you able to put that knowledge into practice when discussing your own treatment? When I was a patient and had my first meeting with the oncologist, I was completely tongue-tied. And I, and I, I, I don't, I, he may have told me much more than I felt or thought he did, but I actually found it remarkably, I was so shocked. And I always spent a long, I think I ought, I did, I'd spend at least three quarters of an hour, if not longer, when talking to new patients with brain tumours. And I always said, you know, if you have further questions, come back, ring my secretary. And I had this wonderful secretary who answered the phone, had been with me for 27 years. This was the, the better aspects of the old NHS. But even though I knew um, that, that patients find it very hard to ask questions, it's usually when they're halfway down the corridor, that the really important questions come out. I, I found the same with myself. Partly because I didn't really want to hear bad news, partly because I just felt so anxious and miserable. And partly because you were probably more aware of what all the possibilities were than the yes, average Yes, yes. And also, funnily enough, I was terribly anxious not to say, you know, I'm a very famous, important neurosurgeon. So, so I was trying to be really very modest and meek. <laughs> it doesn't come that doesn't come naturally to me. And when you met the doctors for your treatment, you asked them to talk to you as a doctor. What did you mean by that? Well, I said I, I, I wanted them to tell me the facts. But at the same time, obviously, I wanted them to give me some hope. So I was a bit muddled about it all. But the whole point is, as I knew already in principle, no doctor knows what's going to happen to me. In, I mean, it's all probabilities. And yet as a patient, I want to know what's going to happen to me. And all the doctor can say as well, there's a 70% chance of this or a 50% chance of that. And, of course, prostate cancer is an old man's disease. So it's actually, there are virtually no reliable statistics on life expectancy because it's the old problem, as with some of the other indolent cancers. The, are you dying with the disease or from the disease? It's really very hard. Like with COVID, you know, it's really very hard to unpick. You say that you used to tell your patients that they had cancer and then try to cheer them up at the same time. That must be quite a difficult thing to do. It's, it's very difficult. And I don't know how successful I was. You never know. I do know that I do public talks and lit- literature festivals and the like. Quite often, former patients, their families come up and say I was jolly nice. But I know perfectly well patients who were disappointed by me will not come and talk to me. So, you know, you, don't, you just don't know. You learn an awful lot 
from your own illness and from your family's illnesses. You can't solve this problem, but you can at least be aware of it and you try to set an example to your trainees. Did your experience of having cancer make you think again about how you had had those same conversations with your patients? No. I went into medicine late. My son had a brain tumour and my wife was severe Crohn's. My first wife, one of my daughters, was severely deaf. So I'd had quite a lot of experience of problems. But what was surprising, and I was rather embarrassed by, was how upset, how panic-struck I was. Although I'd been dealing with death and disease for 40 years, when it was my turn, I was pathetic to begin with. But at the same time, even as I was terribly frightened and upset, and that was before I knew I didn't have metastatic disease, which actually was very likely because of the high PSA. Only 5% of men have a PSA as high as mine. At the same time, I had this immensely strong feeling. I've had an incredibly fortunate life, and I really have no right to complain. Uh, So I had these two simultaneous, I suppose, or head and heart in a way, Um, but I was panic-struck. But at the same time, I realized I really had no right to complain. I've been incredibly lucky and had a really very interesting life, even though I got lots of things wrong and of many regrets. You said your wife talked about your therapeutic catastrophizing. Yes, catastrophizing. Yeah, well, I, I tend to get terribly emotional about things and then come to terms with it, and worst case scenario. Uh, and, you know, I had to come to terms with that I might. I might only have a few months left to live or a year or two. And then, well, and then I thought, actually, I'm, I'm now almost 73. What, what would I do? You know, what would I want to do in two or three years' time, which I can't or don't want to do within the next few months? And the answer was nothing. Obviously, my wife and my family want me to live longer. But, you know, I've had a very full life. One of the things you talked about in your cancer care that you did find frustrating was that much of the care is provided by other members of the team rather than yes. doctors. Yeah. So you found that somewhat disempowering. Well, it is, isn't it? I mean, um, I mean, I don't want to criticise the specialist nurses at all. And they're very good and they're all terribly busy and overworked. Uh, you know, there are 100,000 vacancies in the NHS at the moment. But, um, and it also, I suppose I could have been more demanding with, with the doctors. But it is, you know, you're presented with a sort of fait accompli and you're given lots and lots of handouts and holistic healthcare questionnaires. I lost count of a number of holistic healthcare questionnaires I was sent. So, uh, you know, it's like this wonderful bit of research from Norway. The, the, the longer you have the same GP for, the longer you live, the less often you're in hospital. Continuity of care. I mean, it's a very, very important piece of research published a year ago, I think. And the same applies to hospital work. You know, the the doctor still counts for an awful lot psychologically and is difficult to replace. I'm not knocking specialist nurses at all, not for a moment. If you wanted to have an input into your care or suggest something different, they won't have the authority. No, they won't really. Then you have to go back to the doctor. And the doctors are often quite hard to get hold of. I mean, that's the NHS because it's all horribly stretched. And going back to your comment about Norway, it's also a problem that usually when you go into the NHS, you don't necessarily see the same doctor again. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's also, I think, as far as I make out, GPs are deeply demoralised because what makes medicine so rewarding is the patients. <laughs> it's so wonderful to treat patients. So I was giving a talk two days ago at a literary festival, and then one of the members of the audience stood up and said, Mr Marsh, you saved my life. 26 years ago. I actually remembered her. She had had double aneurysms and a subarachnoid hemorrhage. And, I mean, I, I had lots of failures too, but that is a so rewarding. <laughs> but it's the patient care, it's the patients, and we're losing that because the NHS is so understaffed. A lot of my doctor friends now say to me we're at Eastern European healthcare standards. Yes, it's getting like that. And I've worked in Ukraine for 30 years. Yes, it's getting like that. Because of the totally willful neglect, I was it 12, 15 years of, of market fundamentalist conservative government. But actually, if you look, the King's Fund over the last 30 years, hospital beds in England alone were cut by half. I know. And that's under Labour and Tory governments. 
Well, I know it was the whole business model. And, and that, of course, is because healthcare costs is a huge worldwide problem. Um, so I'm not saying putting more money back into the NHS is going to make the problem go away. I mean, there's a fundamental problem. We, the medicine is getting more and more expensive and the population is getting older and older. But that having been said, uh, it's been woefully underfunded since since the Brown and Blair years. I think one of the other huge impacts has been the private finance initiative, which, although introduced by the Tories, was considerably expanded by the Labour Party into a hospital building programme. As far as I'm concerned, PFI was an economic crime. For people who aren't aware of it, basically, it meant that private companies built hospitals. Yeah. And then the NHS trusts have to pay back the costs of financing these loans. And and it's highly highly profitable. And as... um, Alison Pollock, the, the healthcare professor up in Glasgow, said at the time, it, PFI, even at the beginning, was a lot more expensive than Treasury borrowing. It was a complete swindle, the whole thing. And because I'm particularly interested in the hospital architecture, I mean, we've got a whole pile of really second-rate hospitals at great expense. There's all glossy lobbies and receptions, and then you go through that and you're back in the old prison camps of the past. And the problem for a lot of NHS trusts is repaying these loans is a considerable proportion of their overall budget. I know. It, it's wicked. It was, it's absolutely wicked. And it's ironical that it was a Labour government. You know, the governments can always borrow more cheaply than private companies. I know, I know. It was also a mistaken ideology. But, Henry, do you think we can learn, say, from the French and German systems, for example, which seem to provide a reasonable level of health care? They seem to provide it for everyone. These, these are very complicated questions. I mean, th- th- their model is one of insurance top-ups of various various sorts. How you how you put more money into the system, I, I don't know. That's it needs to be it needs to be done. You're still left with this fundamental problem: the healthcare costs are going up and up and up. And you could spend the entire national income on healthcare, and the entire population would still die, nevertheless. Although I hate bureaucracy, don't we all? I, I spent five years on a nice technology committee, and although I have major reservations about quality analysis, I think nice is brilliant, and the principle behind it of trying to actually compare things. What was interesting that most of the stuff was looking at cancer drugs, and I had to do this sort of clinical assess, clinical appraisals, was how flimsy the quality of life data was from all these randomised controlled trials. So although you had to put in all these figures for the quality analysis, it was pretty flaky, but better than nothing. And of course, the problem is, even with those nice analyses, people haven't got access to the entire trial data. No, exactly. I know. Well, that again, I don't know what's happened to the campaign, but all all trial data should be in the public area. Obviously, Sadly, that's not come to fruition. I know what it should do. I mean, there are many things that could be done to make things a bit better. Every new health secretary ought to read, read Sir Michael Marmot's book, The Health Gap. Health care is so much about social inequality, or disease is so much about social inequality. It's much more important to deal with social inequality than putting more money into the NHS, in, in a sense. Frank Marmot summer says if everybody in, in England had the life expectancy of people who have been to university as a sort of marker for your position on the social ladder, it would save... I can't can count those millions of life years. The one probably biggest thing you could do if you improved everyone's diet. Yes, for sure. But yeah, and that partly depends on, on legislation. And of course, it depends on long term education. These are long term problems that people at the bottom of the social ladder quite rationally fatalistic about their future and therefore live unhealthy lives. Aside from funding of the NHS, what comes through, I think, in all your writing, Henry, is your increasing frustration with NHS bureaucracy. Why has it got so much worse? Um, Basically because it's trying to squeeze blood out of a stone. There was the idea that NHS costs were out of control, which to some extent they were, healthcare costs, and by having management with a capital N, this would somehow make it all more efficient. Um, But, I mean, the problem with that is, uh, although in theory, you can measure some aspects of efficiency in healthcare, although not very well, in my opinion. The management there has thus come into existence to cut costs. 
And when we talk about efficiency savings, it means it's cuts. And so the management is there is just to try to cut things back to the bone. And the other problem is because you can't really measure the output, when things are going poorly, you then appoint more and more managers to assess the problem. But having said that, you know, management is a necessary evil. And, and I don't think, you know, that the actual cost to the NHS and management is not that great. The problem I felt was just this loss of autonomy. And the loss of autonomy was partly cultural, that as a consultant, I had less authority. And if I was going to operate, I had to negotiate with a whole series of power structures. I had to negotiate with the ICU nurses, with the intensivists, with, with a whole series of people because of the lack of beds. And then eventually I'd be allowed to start operating. 20 years ago, I'd said, I'm going to start operating at 30. Everything fell into place perfectly. So there's no point saying things are wonderful in the past. They weren't. But some things are better. And I think the loss of autonomy of consultants is in itself very inefficient. And I'm very worried that things like this incredible spanking new Cleveland private hospital opposite Buckingham Palace is making offers many NHS consultants can't refuse because it's so much nicer to work there. They're paid a salary. Um, it's a not-for-profit, so you don't have to feel too bad about working for it. And they give you all the autonomy and support, which we used to have in the NHS and now don't have. As for being a junior doctor now, I don't know how they cope. I mean, the loss of the firm, the, the short working week has covered a huge cost in terms of respect and involvement and commitment and knowing your patients, which is ultimately what makes the whole thing worthwhile. One of the things you, you do mention is that you felt that more and more time was spent talking about doing your work rather oh, than... No, no, tell me, yeah. Here I start becoming an old man. But, I mean, I literally was operating four days a week 20 years ago. By the time I retired from full-time work seven years ago, it was down to two days a week, and that was more than most surgeons I knew. I mean, the president of the Royal College tells me there are some new consultant jobs being advertised now where you have sort of one session a fortnight, you know, two or two sessions a fortnight. So does that mean the NHS has become less efficient if we've got all of these surgeons who are now performing less operations than they've ever done in the past? I don't know. I'm not sure of the answer to that. In some areas, yes. I mean, yeah, but you see, the, the doctors have changed as well. I mean, the work-life balance. My, my first wife was, fortunately for me, and very much for our children, although she had two, two university degrees, she was willing to stay at home and bring the family up. And I was at work all the time. Now my colleagues and my device will go into the department quite often. You know, they've got working wives. They have to share the school run. Um, I, was on, I was on call for the first few years as a consultant, one in three for the emergencies. As far as I was concerned, I was on call seven days out of seven days a week for my own patients. Now that sort of life sacrificing commitment is not possible nowadays. I don't think it necessarily should be, but the, the world has changed. Um, but on the other hand, you know, it is easier, I think, for doctors to become more detached and sort of seeing it just as a job rather than being the always sort of sacred calling, which at heart I think it's, it should be. Now, you've talked about the sort of conflict between private and public. Yeah. Medicine. You did have a private practice yourself. Oh, yes, how, yes. how did you feel knowing that private patients get a different level of care? Um, it was it was a, it was a bit of a muddle because quite a lot of the private patients I treated in the on the on the in the NHS hospital they got a private room a room on their own. The I, I regarded I mean I regarded it as a sort of um, performance related pay. If you worked hard on the NHS, then you got private referrals. I still, I was doing at the height of my career, I was still doing about 60 hours a week for the NHS and 10 hours a week privately and got paid more for 10 hours. It's all changed now. And my colleagues are paid no more for private work than they were when I was literally 30 years ago. Um, and the insurance costs, it's, it's not in neurosurgery, it's different. And other specialties is is scarcely worth doing private work now because of the insur the malpractice costs. Um, no, anyway, I, I might have deluded myself. I like to think, but purely in terms of 
the way I treat behave towards patients, it was there was very little difference between the private patients and the NHS patients. Um, I, I probably deluding myself a bit, but I tried very hard to. But there shouldn't be a difference other than the bed, the bed situation. And I suppose they got treated quicker. No, they didn't. Not in neurosurgery. It made the, well, yes, for the spinal surgery. If I, the spinal surgery I did in a private hospital. Um, yes, they got treated more quickly. But the serious brain tumour stuff, it made no difference whatsoever. And yes, if you went privately, it was kind of guaranteed the consultant would do the operation. And one of the most difficult things you have as a NHS consultant is delegation and training. And of course, ultimately, but the hypocrisy in the sense of private practice is what people are paying for is not to be trained upon. But that's an sort of uncomfortable truth people don't like to hear. Which we touched on at the start. So given everything that's changed in medicine, Henry, if you were 18 again, would you think twice about a career in medicine? Well, I didn't go into medicine until I was 23. And I think that was very critical. And I didn't discover neurosurgery until I actually was a junior doctor at the age of 31. And then I was an old man in a hurry. I'm a great believer in medicine as a post-experience degree. The idea of school children going straight into medical school from high school is, I think, is a bad idea. But of course, it would cost more. And it's one of the good things about the mad American system is it's all of everybody goes to college first before they go to medical school. So my American trainees, of which there are about 70, I think they came to work in my department, mainly from Seattle, were all older, they're all more mature, they're all better educated, and on the whole, with a few exceptions, they outshone my English trainees, <laughs> rather to my embarrassment. Um, I, I, it's a difficult question because so much has changed. The nature of neurosurgery has changed. When I went into neurosurgery, I went in to become... I was totally hypnotized by aneurysm surgery. That now is largely done non-surgically. When I went became a consultant, I did everything. There was no specialization within neurosurgery. Now it's all much more specialized. Being a junior doctor now, I think, is miserable compared to what it was like when I was one, although I did work madly long hours. So I find that a difficult question to answer. Is medicine deeply rewarding? Yes, because the privilege of treating patients is is absolutely wonderful. And, and doctors should never forget that, however miserable their working conditions. Um, the challenge face in the world is climate change, which I think is a, well, it's already started as a complete catastrophe. I make this comparison in my book between my own denial about my brain scan and my cancer and our denial about climate change. We've missed the boat, really. So if I was a young person now, the argument for going to medicine is doctors will always be needed. And when the world's going to hell and we got mass famine from crop failure, even in Europe, in 20 or 30 years' time, we'll still need doctors. Um, but in terms of trying to make the world a better place, going into environmental campaigning and things like that, or going into politics is actually more important. And if you did go into politics and you had control of the healthcare system, what changes would you make? At the moment, in the short term, I think more money needs to be put into it uh, and some way of persuading the public to pay more tax. But it is horribly expensive in the bottom of the pit. We need a wealth tax. We won't solve the problem, but it will provide a lot more money. And of course, at the moment, we obviously need a windfall tax. Well, on that slightly depressing note, Henry, thank you very really much. Depressing. It's utterly depressing. I still find life wonderfully interesting and exciting. Thank you so much for sparing the time to talk today. All right. Good luck. Great. Thanks a lot, Henry. All right. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. So I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of What Your GP Doesn't Tell You. A reminder, you can sign up for the podcast mailing list at whatyourgpdoesnttellyou.com. Get further details on my Substack newsletter at liztucker.substack.com and follow me on Twitter at Liz C. Tucker. And if you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so either at patreon.com slash what your GP doesn't tell you, or via PayPal at whatyourgpdoesnttellyou.com. Next week, I'm talking to Dr. John Abramson, who was an expert witness in one of the most extraordinary US court cases against a pharmaceutical company when, for the first time, Pfizer Inc. and its subsidiary, Warner Lambert, were accused of racketeering 
under the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organisations Act, an act actually brought in to deal with organised crime. Pfizer and Warner Lambert were accused of off-label marketing of the drug Neurontin for bipolar disorder, migraine and nerve pain. And as we discover next week, the consequences of this court case continue to have major implications for patients and doctors today. So do please join me again next week to find out more. And many thanks for listening. Bye for now.